Welcome to uh, Roundtable. I'm Robert. This is Jordan. This is Johnny. And that's Brandon. Um, today, first of all, actually, before I tell you what we're going to talk about, I need to point something out. We're having a roundtable conversation, right? Uh-huh. All right. It's a rectangle table. I know that that's bothered somebody for the past six weeks or however long we've been doing this. It's a rectangle table. We know. So now that this is out of the way, we're going to talk about <laughs> alcohol. And... Um, we're going to talk about boundaries in alcohol and kind of where that's supposed to go, what that looks like, and kind of how the church is supposed to look on it. First thing that we're going to do here is disclaimer. Um, the Wesleyan Church, Wesleyan pastors are not supposed to drink alcohol, so we all know that, and we're not talking about anything that happens with us right now. We're talking about things in the past, but we do want to be honest with you guys and not act like we're perfect people. So, um First thing I'd like to ask is, Jordan, how much alcohol have you consumed in your life? <laughs> um, I've had one communion cup worth of wine at an Episcopal church. And it made you And sick. NyQuil. That's it? Yeah, oh yeah, and it made We have to sick. include NyQuil? It Dude, has alcohol in it. We have to in include it. NyQuil in my college years. I'm shocked. <laughs> okay, all right. So. Good. Jordan is Good. our, uh, he's our control group here. He's the one who's going to bring some levity to the conversation and keep us from diving too far into college stories and military stories. But um, anyway, Brandon, let's talk about this just a little bit. You were a Marine. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what, I don't know, how, how, did, how did managing like alcohol consumption and all of that work in the military? Is it? So, um, and I'm just being honest, you really uh, would drink a six pack Monday through Friday and then Friday through Saturday, you could tie it on kind of it was the limitation um, and basically the way that our our commands really handled it was um, be responsible that's all they told us was you, you just be responsible so um, a younger unsaved um, not pastor drank fairly regularly when I was when I was a lot younger and there wasn't um, they now they've cleaned that up they've cleaned that up a lot because Marines kind of had a reputation of, of uh, getting drunk and fighting which were accurate you know kind of views of us there for a little bit, but they uh, they realized a lot of the issues that were happening in the units were tied directly to overindulgence in alcohol. So a lot of the units started to create, you know, they started to put in uh, different safeguards and guardrails and stuff like that. And even we started as sergeants and staff sergeants and stuff kind of counseling our Marines to be smart when they consume alcohol and getting them to understand you don't always have to drink yourself into blackout drunk, which is where some of the guys were. Um, especially during the war, because there was really no emphasis on it at all. And during the war, it was like, you go out, you fight, and then when you come home for, you know, a year, you get smashed, and then you go back out and you fight again. That's just kind of the, the cycle we got on. Yeah, so um, what's it like trying to manage a group of, of guys that, that all, look, I mean, men with high testosterone levels yeah. are more likely to consume more alcohol and be more just reckless, period, right? Yeah. And... There, there's a lot of parents out there who have kids that are kind of in that age range, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't know what it's like to parent them, but you do know, you do know what it's like to lead them. What's that, what's that like? Well, we did kind of parent a bunch of 18-year-olds uh, doing that same kind of thing. <laughs> um, so the way that we handled it was the a lot of guys come in, and, and again, in the Marines, it was like developing a warrior cast, like just a group of men who want to fight and they go out to fight but then with that comes all of the play hard too like you work hard you play hard is what our first sergeant used to say and so as the sergeants and stuff we would kind of get a hold of the younger guys and explain to them um if you're going to drink you need to do it with people who are going to have your best interest at heart so we would always tell them like make sure you go out with a group of friends don't drink on the weekdays like I, and i was guilty of drinking monday through friday and nothing was off limits because I was in good enough shape. I could drink, show up, PT in the morning, and then keep going. And we try to start teaching our Marines, don't do that. That's not a good thing to do. That's not the right, uh, wise way to handle things. So it was just a lot of um, getting them to see and breaking the idea that in order to be this man and in order to be this um, tough guy, man, over-the-top kind of attitude is that you need to drink your whiskey straight. You need to be drunk every night. You need to do all of this. Breaking that attitude was um, a big, big part of it. I, I ask all those questions because I think I think moderation is kind of that's that that's the moral of the story. I think that's the moral of the story for everybody. Um, but uh, but but also it does bring into light like 
like, I mean, just we're all guys here. We didn't, you know, somehow we ended up with a bunch of dudes on this one. And, uh, and you know, like, that's it for in pop culture and all that, like being able to hold your drink is a big deal. And, and that's a, that's a thing. So, um, I think it kind of speaks to a lot of things. What, what are your experiences in the world of, uh, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I mean, alcohol. I thought that, uh, I was going to be the control, but it's Jordan. So that's actually, <laughs> it's like, wow, wow. But, um, I mean, I, I was very, for some reason, like, uh, I don't know. I grew up very worried about it. And there was like this underlying fear that I would have a problem. And I don't know if that was because on both my parents' families, like aunts and uncles and, you know, all over the place, there's a lot of like addiction with just drugs and alcohol and a bunch of other issues. So I guess maybe there's this underlying fear that like that would maybe happen. So I stayed away from it as much as I could. But like the most I ever had was uh, I had a flight and like that kind of made me walk a little wobbly. So like just what that's what it's called a flight, right? Where it's like a little like, like a bunch of beers, like, oh, a, bunch like of a bunch beers. of little and it's like yeah. four we ounces that, per we cup. We call that a Friday night, dude. You I'm, know, yeah. a Friday night. <laughs> no, it's like it's like nothing, like a total a of what, 16 ounces? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's a beer appetizer. So, yeah. And then, you know, two beers probably. It's Usually flights of beers also set. have disgusting beers. So, though. but uh, anyway, that's kind of my experience. <laughs> the uh, so for let me for me, I, I when I was in college, I, I uh, I mean, I, I, I drank a lot, so uh, it was mostly on the weekends, but I, you know, and there's just a lot of, a lot that, that kind of came with that too. For me, I was always binge drinker and usually I'd wake up in the morning and not know what happened the night before mm -hmm. and have to piece it back together. Yep. And, um, you know, I, it was a lot of that for me, especially those times when it was just out of control had to do with internal problems, um, things that I was dealing with that just, I couldn't couldn't put a, a real handle on um and so that 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 and you mentioned this before too part of why you didn't want to really get into all that is because you had family um that it had problems and 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 a lot of times it is a way to deal with something internal that you just don't know how to deal with i think you know i think a lot of times culture and everything else like we're supposed to just be able to handle whatever and you're a man get over it and um and so you don't develop coping mechanisms for those things. And, and I think a lot of times it devolves into this um, dependence on alcohol, whether it's a, a binging thing or a lifestyle of alcoholism. So can you talk a little bit about why you've been so straight laced and I, and like, seriously, yeah. be, don't like, yeah, be real so, about it. So, um, I mean, I guess for me, it's been, um, there's some where we just never had in the house growing up. Um, for my dad, uh, he watched his older siblings um, just abuse it. Uh, and my uncle, uh, my aunts, uh, they all were just very, um, uh, they abused it through college. My dad was about 10 years younger than all three of them. And so it was just this thing where growing up, he saw the worst of it. You know, my uncle one time got so drunk, uh, they fell asleep and his sisters completely shaved his head bald. And that was back in like the 70s, 80s when like, you know, he had hair down yeah. to his shoulders, you know. And uh, my dad went to college, said, no, that's not what I want to do. Um, and then growing up, we just we were never around it. Um, you know, the other piece to it, too, is when, when I was eight, nine, ten years old, um, two things happened in my family. One was I had an aunt die. Um, she had cancer and she drank herself to death. Um, mm -hmm. Once she got the diagnosis, no one in the family knew that she had cancer or anything until one day we got a call. Hey, she's gone. And then um, uh, my uncle, uh, he... He got um, he got in head-on collision with a drunk driver, and that drastically affected his life until now. I mean, he's been, you know, had health issues for 16, 17 years because of it. So, I guess for me, growing up, it was just, man, this has led to a lot of negative things, and you know, it's something that I just don't want to dabble with. I, I don't think that anybody who's been drunk would disagree with that. It leads to a lot of negative things. But, yeah. Yeah. Every bad, yeah. most bad decisions that I've ever made happened when I was inebriated significantly. Yeah. There's, there's nights I could have made tons of bad decisions yeah. that I don't remember because I made bad decisions and getting that drunk to make more bad decisions. Like yeah. it, it's, it's a, uh, it's almost like a snowball effect. And some of the most embarrassing things that ever happened in my life happened because I was drunk. Yep. You know, um, I think I think that there's this weird tension, right? Because you have 
you have uh, just straight up in American culture, it's alcohol is something that is um, drunkenness is something that's funny. Um, it's something that you make fun of people for. It's something that you make fun of yourself for. You know, and there are there are parts of our culture where we try to say, no, that's bad. That's not smart. That's, you know, and those parts are very admirable. You're talking about mothers against drunk driving and things of that nature. And, and we do try to. But but I mean, you know, turn on a Netflix special. There's going to be a story about somebody getting drunk, like a comedy special, you know. And then you have the cultural like that comes with different subcultures in America. You know, you talk about, uh, you know, we we're talking about some of the military experience, but also frat parties, college, you know, you have all of that. Um, and so you have all of this kind of, from a church perspective, a pastoral perspective, you have all of this over here that's kind of glorifying it. And then you have the church over here that's kind of saying, a lot of churches say, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. And there's, it. right, so there's this weird disconnect. What do you think, Johnny, what do you think about how, how, do, how do we find balance? Because Jesus did turn water into wine. Mm-hmm. So no, not at all kind of feels like, well, Jesus couldn't come to my church. Mm -hmm. But then Jesus didn't have any frat party stories. So yeah. what, what's the, how do you find balance? I mean, I think like uh, when, I, when I surrendered my life to Jesus, I was super um, like, I don't know, anal about it, for lack of a better word. I don't know what else to say about it. I was very like uptight. And I think I pushed a lot of people away. Because I think I missed a ton of opportunities to connect with people that if I was, you know, I know Wesleyans aren't supposed to drink or whatever or church people in general. But like if I was willing to just like be next to someone that was having a drink, like even if I was like, hey, dude, I'm good. But like hang out with those people, I would have had a lot of good conversations and met a lot of people. But because I wasn't willing, because it made me so uncomfortable and because honestly, like in my heart, I would condemn them. Like, what's wrong with you? Why are you so like this? You know? Um, like I probably pushed a lot of people away. I probably made a lot of people uncomfortable and I missed a lot of opportunities. So I feel like, I don't know, like it's all about control. Like if you're able to, you know, if you're a believer and you're able to connect with someone that otherwise you wouldn't, you know, over a beer, like you should be able to do that. Yeah. Or if you wanted to have wine with your wife at night, like you should be able to do that, but you have to have the control. Um, yeah. so it's yeah. just a social thing, you know? Yeah, I think, like, the important thing is to not um, vilify it. You know, I think alcohol, you know, it'd be easy for people to look at me and say, you know, well, you've had all these stories, you know, in your past where it's, you know, alcohol is yeah. absolutely wrong. And I, I don't believe that. You know, I think that alcohol, um, I, I was, I read a book uh, by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell, and basically, over the course of him telling a few stories, he, he comes to the conclusion that alcohol basically, um, it amplifies whatever the context that it's consumed in is, right? So in the military, right, you have all these guys that are amped up on testosterone. You know, they drink too much. They start getting in fights. You know, there's this, yep. this culture where it's, all right, this is now amplified. You look at college campuses and you see, you know, just a hypersexualized experience, you know, and you end up with all sorts of horrible stories that come out of that and people that can't piece together what actually happened because everyone was so drunk. But then by the same token, you know, you also have, you know, times when you have dinner parties and you have people that are hanging out in a relaxed fashion and they're sitting there, they're enjoying one or two glasses of wine and it, it enhances the mood, right? It's not this like disastrous thing. You know, alcohol doesn't always take this path where it completely ends up in ruin and destruction. Mm -hmm. It can, it's dangerous, but I think the perspective we have to have on it is not, oh my gosh, it's this awful thing. But hey, what's the context that we're consuming it in, and what's it really going to amplify here? Is it going to amplify health, yeah. or is it going to amplify destruction and, and unhealth? That's good. Yeah, thoughts. Guard. Uh, I kind of think of it like guardrails. Like you got to yeah. have protection, and, and the way that um, me, and, me and my wife were talking about this on the drive up here, we were just kind of weighing it because you know I haven't drank since I got out of the Marine Corps because I was like, oh, well, Wesleyans don't do that. I'm just, I'm very, I'm very understanding of rules. Like I'm, okay, this is the way it happens. That's what I'm going to do for now. And that's just the way it is. So I just thought, okay, that just doesn't happen. Also, I grew up in a church context too, that like didn't allow any fun at all. Like if it was fun, stop thinking about it. You're not allowed to have it. And then I also, <laughs> it's, that's the church I grew up in. So don't go to baseball really? games because your mind's off God. Like my mind's off God if I'm walking down the hallway sometimes because I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, growing up in that 
culture and that view, I was in the other place of, you know, I'm going to stay completely away from it when I came into the church. Prior to that, though, my dad drinks and still does drink. And he drank in the house and my mom drinks in the house. But it never, with with the parents I grew up with, never got violent. It never got bad. My dad is just an irritating drunk. He's like that guy that gets, if he becomes drunk, you know he becomes drunk because he'll start messing with you. He'll start playing pranks on you. He'll start. He'll really start messing with you, and that's when you know Dad's had a little too much, right? <laughs> and and then my mom it gets like slap happy. So I never had that. But my biological father, on the other hand, he was a violent drunk. He was the one that would hurt people when he was drunk. And then my grandfather, the same thing. He would hurt people when he was drunk. So I had like both ends of the spectrum. And I think it comes to balancing guardrails. Like yeah. the rule, if I was ever going to drink again, the rule that I would apply to myself is. Just if I feel like for just a moment that I'm losing control of my ability to make a decision, I'm done drinking. Because I think that's what Jesus was getting at. And I really think that's what Paul is talking about when he says in Ephesians, don't give yourself to drunkenness. I really think he's, he's drilling down on the idea that you don't want to remove your ability to make a good decision because of something in this world. You don't want to consume enough alcohol to when then you're not going to act the way Jesus called you to act if you're if you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian and you're listening to this podcast, you don't want to make dumb decisions, right? Like you just don't want to make stupid yeah. decisions, so don't drink so much alcohol that you make stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing really comes down to 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 guardrails. You know, it's just you got to have something in place that's going to keep you on the straight and narrow. Because if not, alcohol is one of those things for some people that it could get completely out of control. For, for me, I, I didn't really ever get, like, addicted to the point when it was hard to stop. I just did it because it was fun. Like, I just thought that was what I was – that's what I that's what my boys did. We went out to the bars. That's what we did. But when I decided I'm going to stop, it wasn't like, you know, I'm like, I'm going to have a beer. Like, it wasn't like that for me. But it was like guardrails. Uh, I, think, I think it's – I think it's – I think the guardrails thing is good. I think part of – part of the, the – the struggle um, is we're saying things that sound a hundred percent reasonable, you know, and um, and still there are going to be people on either ends of the spectrum that are just like, yeah, y'all are crazy, you know. Um, I, 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 I having this topic is something that was a little weird, just because I mean, look, the Wesleyan Church is it's a alcohol is a hot topic in the Wesleyan Church right now because there's things that are that are making it. Uh, to general conference, kind of talking about maybe potentially changing some of the rules. I think it did last. I don't remember. It's church politics, but the, there's some of that stuff we're not supposed to, and all of that. But at the end of the day, like I feel, I feel like, man, we've the church has jacked this up. Mm. You know, we've we've hidden in our in our holes and and covered ourselves with our Bible and acted like Jesus turned that water into grape juice. And, and and just not engaged in part of what the rest of, I mean, dude, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and bars are allowed to deliver beer to your homes, mm -hmm. it, at least in the state of Maryland. You know what I mean? Like, this is a I huge part of culture. I think we're still allowed culture. to go in Virginia. I think we can still go to the bar yeah. in Virginia. Not that I'm keeping track, but yeah. I think we can still <laughs> Yeah. So, like, you know, like, it's a, that's one of those things, like. Man, how did we miss it so bad? You know, how did we miss it so bad? How how come my friend tells a story that he says he drank too much tequila and he crapped himself? Great story. <laughs> and uh, and that's it. That's all we get. We don't get the. Whole yeah, story. I don't know. I'm not giving you the off rest camera. Of the story, that's so fine. yeah, yeah, off yeah. camera. But it, it's like the church views everyone that ever drank a beer that way, like they're running around with poop in their pants, or they're a violent alcoholic, and and it's loaded with shame. Right, yeah. and and we just we've jacked it up so much. We've jacked it up so much because the one thing I will tell you is I, I I've probably never had more open, honest conversations with a group of just guys than sitting around a campfire with a beer in my hand. Mm -hmm. And how did we miss that? We're supposed to be the ones that care about relationships the most, mm -hmm. and somehow we've missed it. We've just missed the boat out of judgmentalism, like you were mm -hmm. talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the the churches um over the last few years like you were saying villainize it and almost demonize it to where you can't um it's not it's almost taboo to to even say this like there's going to be some wesleyans and people that may hear this podcast and be like i'm not going to that church anymore i cannot believe they are talking about this topic yeah. 
But it's, it's something that's happening in our culture and something that we need to be able to address and something that we need to, to, to talk about because this is what it is. You don't want your actions or your attitude or the way you're preaching and teaching things and, and the way that your people are so judgmental and hateful towards something to where your church can't have drunkards come in. Yeah, I yeah, want yeah. somebody that's incredibly hungover, that's the, that, that can barely remember last night in mm-hmm. our church. Like, mm-hmm. I want somebody like that yeah. because that somebody is looking for something. They're not finding it in the bottom of a bottle. So at least maybe I can get you to trip over Jesus on the way in if you're drunk, right? Like, maybe I can get you to do yeah. that. So yeah. I want a church that's going to be accepting of, hey, this is your problem. Because, I mean, let's be honest. We get everybody lined up and we start talking about problems. Maybe it's not alcohol for some of our church goers and for all of us. Maybe it's not yeah. alcohol. But we got our own problems. That, yeah. You know what? And Jesus doesn't necessarily outline exactly alcohol. But, man, he says if you got anger in your heart, you might as well commit murder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That seems worse. Mm-hmm. But some reason we say anger is okay yeah. as, long as, it does, as long as you don't sin in it and you can be angry towards somebody. You know, we pick and choose. Yeah. The church picks and chooses. And I think that... To be honest, we have to get away from that and get back to the core of what Jesus was teaching. Which, if you go back to the core of what he was teaching, you're not going to want to drink that much because you're not going to want to lose control over your situation and your attitudes and the way you're doing things because he calls you to love and care for people. You can't love and care for people if you're driving head on and drunk driving, right? You can't love and care for people if you're drunk and violently hurting your wife or your kids. You can't love people if that's what you're doing. I feel like, yeah, I just feel like people, like, get that mm. you know what i mean yeah. so the the uh the at least the extremes that you were that you were mentioning but you said something about we pick and choose mm-hmm. and there's this quote by a guy named rich mullins he, uh the song awesome god he wrote awesome god yeah. Yeah, yeah. um yeah so rich mullins the quote is um he basically said that's why god made highlighters so i could highlight the things i like and ignore the things i don't mm. And it was a, he was he was being he's been facetious, you know. But as Christians, we do that a lot, man. We pick mm-hmm. something that we that we think is a taboo topic, or that we think that we should we should you know, be like I don't know that we think that we have a personal bias against, yeah. and we pick that thing out and call it some you know the unforgivable sin. And at yeah. the end of the day, like sin put Jesus on the cross, not a sin, all sin yeah. put yep. Jesus on the cross, and yep. and we have to we have to handle ourselves with some. With some, uh, I don't know, equanimity yeah. across the board. Yeah. And the church does that. It picks and chooses things. And it does the same thing with the super taboo stuff like sex and things like that. We'll, mm-hmm. Won't talk about it on Sunday. Won't yeah. preach about Let's it. Let's not we'll talk about pot at all. all yeah, right? I mean, We're right? not doing one of those on this. Yeah. One of these on that. that that'll never happen. Yeah. <laughs> Probably happen next week. Um, <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Look, Bonus content. Yeah. Um, this is, I think, let's, let's we. I don't know, you, you guys, anything else you guys want to say? Otherwise, I'm going to close this out here. No, go ahead. All right, so I think um, I think moral of the story is you have to have some level of balance. And um, if you're out there and, and you have, you know, you, you've been hurt by the church because of this issue or, or that's something that has turned you off to the church, like, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry. Um, and if you're out there and alcohol has been something that's hurt your life, um, I want to say I'm sorry. And on both ends of this thing, man, we're praying for you. We love you. And and at, what we really want more than anything is that that the 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 love of God could move in your life. And and that's our goal. Um, but we also, I think, amongst all of us, we come from a ton of different backgrounds and everything else. I think we just realize, like, man, Jesus turned water into wine for his first miracle. It's probably not the the worst thing in the world. But at the same time, um, it's probably not a good idea to be running around um, crapping your pants because of tequila. So uh, with that, uh, thanks for watching. We love you. You